Have you been a blessing to someone today? I hope so. I hope that I have been a blessing to someone today. I think that God calls us every day to, as we share the grace of Christ through the way in which we live, to be a blessing that we don't even know about, perhaps, to someone with whom we come in contact. Serious subject tonight, Can We Cast Out Demons, Part 2. We're looking at Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20. If you have your Bibles, please open to that passage because there's some very important things in here that we need to learn about because we live in an age which I believe is full of demonic activity. It's more subtle in some ways than it was at the time of the Apostle Paul. It's more subtle than it has been at other periods of history where it's quite overt. But we find it in particular, a particular type of demon, very active today in our political culture here in the United States. And the Lord willing, we'll be talking about that a little bit more as we go along. We're in Acts chapter 19. I'll begin reading in verse 11 through 20. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had the evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of, the Lord, of God and prevailed. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you might indeed magnify your word. The scripture declares that you've magnified your word above all your name. And Father, we pray that you will help us as we see the word of God prevailing here in this passage to be reminded that we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is what you've given to us. We're so excited about charismatic type of activities, or most Americans are, that we fail to realize that we have something far more powerful. We have the Word of God. Father, we pray for your blessings on this message tonight, that it will bring glory to Jesus Christ and that it will give evocation and encouragement to those who are believers, that it might bring a sense of awe and fear in the hearts of those who are not believers and those who perhaps among the believers have been doing evil things, which we find going on here in this passage. Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. In quick review, this is the second part of this passage that we've been looking at, that we noticed that there was carnal opposition in verses 8 through 10. And then when that didn't stop Paul, we see the opposition began to move in intensity with demonic warfare. As Paul begins to perform these various miracles, we find a counterfeit going on, some demonic warfare taking place. We also began to see an increase in Paul's use and exercise of his supernatural apostolic gifts. The three that we saw that were mentioned in this passage are the special miracles, the healings, and the casting out of demons, those special miracles with the handkerchiefs and the aprons, and so on. 
We talked about how God sometimes does use an instrument in the hand of his servants. We've seen that with Moses and his rod and Aaron and his rod. But not all miracles are healings, and that's a very important thing for us to remember. One of the miracles that Paul performed earlier in the book of Acts was when he blinded Elymas, the sorcerer. That was not a healing. In this passage in Acts, we saw one subcategory under healings mentioned, the use of a secondary physical item to produce a healing. And sometimes we see people in the Bible trying to do that, but without success. We gave the example last time we were on this passage of Elijah trying to use his rod in the hand of his servant Gehazi to raise the dead son of the Shunammite woman, and it didn't work. That was in 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 8 through 37. He had to go himself. When we studied the spiritual gifts, we also saw some connections to this passage that we have before us tonight. We looked at what Stephen was doing in Acts 8. There was demonic activity there that also showed up. Simon the sorcerer, the one who got converted and then tried to buy the supernatural power of the apostles, you recall that, and for his trouble he brought down a curse upon himself. That's a very dangerous thing to do, coveting the ability to perform supernatural powers and healings has always been a temptation of carnal and apostate teachers. That's very clear from the New Testament. We see a great deal of manifestation of that today in the charismatic movement. We saw that both with Simon the Sorcerer in Acts 8 and the seven sons of Sceva here in Acts 19, and it's no different today than it was then. Acts 8, we looked at sort of as a foundation for this study, and you recall that it showed eight, excuse me, it showed a, a, at least 12 different key Bible doctrines that give us the key to Acts chapter 19. The establishment of the church at the beginning of the book of Acts and the things that happen in the initial chapters are essential to understand what is happening in these later chapters of the book of Acts. And so the things we saw, there were 12 things that it covered. The composition of the church, the content of the gospel, and the magnificence of the grace of God, the gift of evangelists, the purpose of the spiritual gifts, the spiritual gifts of healings and miracles, biblical demonology, witchcraft, and the many forms of the occult condemned by scripture, the God's choice of battlefields and the spiritual warfare, and all those central things right there in that middle are things that affect what we are studying tonight in Acts 19. The evident marks of salvation, the issue of falling away after salvation, chastening and sin in the life of the believer, the kingdom of God and the church, and the meaning and proper subjects of baptism. Acts 8 covered all 12 of those topics. We saw a contrast between Stephen in chapter 7 and Philip in chapter 8 that helped us understand Paul's contest in chapter 19. Philip was successful in a different way than Stephen's success, though there were similarities. Stephen was an apologist, that is, he argued the defense of the faith. Philip was an evangelist. Stephen was given the gift of miracles. He had supernatural powers but he got killed. Philip performed supernatural miracles, he cast out demons, he did multiple healings, but he was not killed. God doesn't have to work the same way in everybody's life. Just because you have a particular spiritual gift does not mean that you are going to have the same results as somebody else who has that same spiritual gift. Stephen faced evil Jewish leaders and false witnesses under the direct control of Satan himself. Philip faced a single evil Samaritan sorcerer and multiple people who were demon-possessed. God put them in different contexts. And we need to recognize, each one of us, that God has given us spiritual gifts, but he puts us in different contexts. We're in contact with different groups of people. There's nobody in this room here tonight that has exactly the same contacts. We have some overlapping contacts. But God has put us as a testimony in a very specific sphere whereby we should exercise the things that God has given to us to bring him glory. And someday we'll give account for that. You won't have to give account for not having reached somebody that in your immediate neighborhood right now uh, has not reached. You have a responsibility for the ones people, the people that God puts in, in front of you. Are you doing it? So we see that even here in the early church with, with Stephen and Philip. We saw that there were three different year, words that were used for Stephen's gifts and for which he was killed. We saw power, dunamis, the dynamic explosive power. We get our word dynamite from that. It's an irresistible power with a focus on the internal nature of the power. We saw the word wonders, that's the word teros in Greek, that which causes amazement, 
The focus is on the effect of the mind of the person who sees the powerful thing performed and it shuts mouths and stops them dead in their tracks. And the third word that, word that was used for Stephen's supernatural gifts was semion, a sign. A sign, that which authenticates the messenger. And we see that going on over in Acts chapter 19 as the Apostle Paul does exercise dunamis and teras, but he also is demonstrating the purpose and the authentication of the message because it's the word of God which prevails as we get to the end of that passage. All three of those words we saw occur in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, explaining the purpose. God was bearing witness to the apostles with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles, all three of those words are used there, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. That was a clear statement of the temporary nature of the spiritual gifts, the sign gifts, not all the sign, all spiritual gifts, but the sign gifts during the apostolic period. God bearing them witness. That was prophesied by Christ in the Gospels. We saw that this is a key to answering the question, can we cast out demons? Christ said it was the apostles who would be casting out demons and that it was a proof of their apostolic authority. Mark chapter 16, we looked at that in some detail, and he said that there would be certain signs that, that those who believed would do, and he's talking to the 11 who have not believed, and then after they believed, it says, the Lord working with them. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, Mark 16, 20. Always take it in its context. A lot of folks like to pull that out and they say, well, I've believed so I can therefore, uh, I can cast out demons and I can drink deadly things and I can take up serpents and, you know, I can, I can uh, you know, do all kinds of other things and heal people. They grab this Mark passage. The problem is it was addressed to the apostles. If I tell one of my children a certain thing that they should do, it doesn't necessarily apply to the other children. If I give a specific assignment to one, it does not apply to another. And that's what was going on here. The miraculous gifts were designated to authenticate the message of the apostolic messengers prior to the completion of the New Testament. It was the apostles in Mark who had failed to believe. We're not told all the different kinds of miracles that happened in the days of the apostles, but they included striking people to death, that's Ananias and Sapphira, smiting people with blindness, Elimus the sorcerer, Paul shaking off the poisonous snake into the fire, and so on. And we also looked at many of the different kinds of miracles in the Old Testament, which were not healings, and of course all of the miracles that Moses performs with the um, before Pharaoh, those things are not healings. Healings is not used of Stephen's miracles. We noted that... Uh, powers and wonders and miracles that Stephen did, we weren't told, but they certainly authenticated his message and refuted his opponents. They didn't keep him from getting killed. There were many other things we covered. I'm going to skip over those right now, but in apostolic period, preaching was always connected to healings and miracles. The word for preaching, euangelizo, the word from which we get our English word evangelize, that is to give the good news, is the word that is used of the preaching of Stephen, the word that is used of the preaching of Philip, the word that is used of the preaching of the Apostle Paul, and Philip himself is called Philip the Evangelist in Acts 21, we haven't gotten there yet, in verse 8. And by the way, that will raise some very interesting questions because it talks about uh, his daughters who prophesied. So did women have the gift of prophecy? And um, you ought to be able to guess that one in advance, but um, Acts chapter 21, we'll talk about that when we get there. Euangelizo is used concerning Philip's preaching when the Samaritans and Simon the sorcerer both believed. Philip preached Christ and got both carnal opposition and demonic opposition. We looked at the description in Acts chapter 8 of what was going on there at the Samaritan revival. It pointed to the kind of demonic activity and demon possession that faced Philip at that time. It was unclean demons, which is what we find going on in Acts chapter 19. There are many different kinds of demons, just like there are different types of angels. Uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 6 describes them in different levels of authority, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, and Paul lists a whole different group of military terms that are used there for the different levels of demonic authority. But the ones that are being dealt with here in Acts 8 and then again in Acts chapter 19 are unclean demons, demons of moral impurity. 
The same kind of immoral demons were present when the sons of Sceva here tried to cast out a demon. The demon stripped them naked, it tells us. In Acts chapter 8, it said, For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. We noted that the crowd contained many demon-possessed people. You know, there are a humongous number of demons. One-third of the angelic host fell and followed Satan. We don't know how many billions of angels God created, but you think of a third of that number in different levels of authority, in different abilities, in different powers. Each one is an individual. They're not all clones of each other, just like you're not a clone of anybody else. But they fall into different categories and different levels and different forms of perversion. Some focus on theology, some focus on immorality. That's what's going on in this passage here. The demons are called unclean spirits. The word translated unclean is akathartos, without cleanness. It's used in the New Testament most frequently of lewdness and moral impurity motivated by demonic forces. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27, and this is where we see it so prevalent in our society today. It is used of sodomy and lesbianism. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Romans 6, verse 19, it's used of habitual immorality. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. That's repeated, habitual moral sin. Even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. There should be a different habitual lifestyle for the Christian than the immoral lifestyle. In 2 Corinthians 12, 20 through 21, it's used of fornication and shameless nudity. In Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, which is the works of the flesh, you know, works of the flesh are contrasted with the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it's listed in the first group of sins with adultery, fornication, and lasciviousness. In Ephesians 4, 19, it's portrayed as brainless, unfeeling, greedy, passionate immorality. And by the way, I think I've pointed this out before, but greed and covetousness are often tied to immorality and uncleanness in the Bible because there is money to be made, filthy lucre, with nudity and immorality, pornography, being one of the largest grossing non-taxed businesses in the world today. It's not merely controlled by the lust of the flesh, it's controlled by demonic forces defiling people on a mega level because they know that mankind is the object of God's love and plan of redemption, and that God is holy. That's why you see so much of it spread around today. In Ephesians 5, 3 through 10, it's classified with fornication, covetousness, idolatry, obscenity, and whoremongers. We're talking about uncleanness because that's related to the unclean demons. In Colossians 3, 5 through 8, it's again connected to fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, it's contrasted with the type of preaching that Paul did. You know, some of you probably remember when a rather famous charismatic TV personality came on stage and with his friend who was with him in this dialogue, were talking about how a certain woman had just ministered to them so much the night before. And they joked about it, and it later came out that what they were talking about was an immoral orgy that these two so-called Christian leaders were involved in. Uncleanness is contrasted with the type of preaching that Paul did. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3-8, uncleanness is contrasted with holiness. 
For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And then jumping down a verse, not in the lust of concupiscence, that's epithumia, which literally means upon hot passion, a lust that is forbidden, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Down in verse 7, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Holiness, which God has called you to and which is the will of God, is contrasted with uncleanness. And then notice verse 8 very well, 1 Thessalonians 4.8. He therefore that despiseth, that is, if you don't pay attention to this, what are you despising? He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his holy spirit. The Apostle Paul is setting a contrast, not merely in the physical world, but in the spirit world, where there is the Holy Spirit and there are the unclean spirits. And when you are possessed by the Holy Spirit, it affects the way in which you live in a very, very definite manner. When you are possessed by an unclean spirit or motivated, impelled by an unclean spirit, it affects the way you live in another very definite manner manner. I hope you're getting the point that trying to cast out demons without authority puts you in a very dangerous category, especially when you're dealing with unclean demons. In 2 Peter 2, 9 and 10, uncleanness is one of the main character markers of the apostates. In Revelation 16, 12 through 14, it is unclean spirits that work miracles and control the world during the tribulation period. And we have studied in the past, we've seen that lewd immorality is going to be one of the major hallmarks of the tribulation period. Folks, we're moving toward that time right now. I'm looking for the rapture any day because the way in which this country and this world is going demonstrates the control of this particular type of spirit which will be rampant during the tribulation period. We saw that in Revelation 18, 1 and 2, unclean spirits will be confined to the fallen Babylon on the eve of its destruction. And so that <clears throat> brings us to our study tonight. That was all review. This same demonically motivated sexual impurity is seen repeatedly in the Gospels where Christ casts out unclean demons. For example, the nudist Gadarene demoniac who wore no clothing. And there's a special word for this in the New Testament. Nudism is manifested by a word, it's called aselgia. That's the word that's translated lasciviousness. Now, you've probably read through your Bible a hundred times or maybe more, and you've come across that word lasciviousness, and you knew it from its context that it was pretty bad. Aselgia, lasciviousness. That is a word that means uninhibited shamelessness, marked by nudity and demonism. During the hippie movement of the 1960s, some of you probably remember that, there were continual reports over the radio about naked young people fornicating on top of their paisley painted VW vans at the California beaches. It was rampant. There were the hippie nudist colonies that were so-called free love where nobody knew whose child was whose child. That's a selgia. That's lasciviousness. I personally think that lasciviousness has crept into the modern American church in evangelical churches, charismatic churches, liberal churches for sure, but even to some churches which would theologically be in agreement with us. Lasciviousness is there, particularly in the clothing styles of girls and women, but it's also seen in the body decorations, the tattoos, the body piercings, and the body revealing clothing of boys and men. You know, whenever I'm on vacation, and I try to take vacation occasionally, whenever I'm on vacation, no matter where I am, and especially if I'm driving around the country, I always stop for prayer meeting, and I always stop for Sunday school, morning worship, and evening worship. And sometimes on a Sunday, there will be several different churches that I get to visit because I'm very interested in seeing what is going on in Christian America. And of course, I don't go to the liberal churches, but I do try to find Bible-believing churches. And I use things like the Dallas Theological Seminary 
alumni directory, which lists all of the alumni and where they are located, and whether they're a pastor or a youth pastor or director of Christian education or something, and the name and location of their church. So these are guys that agree with me on most theology. I am astounded when I go to those churches how many almost unclothed women are there. You can't even look certain directions in church. Folks, that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be a holy people. We're supposed to be a people who exemplify moral purity, where it is seen by the way in which we dress and the way in which we live. A Christian needs to be always aware of the demonic trend and never mindlessly copy it just because it's fashionable. Notice what it says about the, uh, the nudist demoniac in Luke 8, verse 27. When he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. Notice how it contrasts after he got saved in verse 35. Then went they out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of Jesus and it makes an emphasis, a point, clothed and in his right mind. Unclean demons possess people who show up in religious settings in disguise, that is without an open manifestation. A person can be involved with and have some of these demonic forces but the demon also knows that to get in and infiltrate certain types of situations, he needs to be in disguise and not open. So they do show up in synagogues and churches. There are churches where demons are present. I suspect in the past and possibly at the present time, this church may have some people who are interacting with demons. You never know. You never know, unless when Jesus was present, they got scared out of their mind and blurted it out. Mark 1.23, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. They understand the difference between uncleanness and holiness. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit, the text makes a point of it, what kind of a demon this was. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him, and they were all amazed, insomuch as they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. In other words, wow, he can even get rid of the unclean spirits. We know there are a lot of different kinds of demons out there, but even the unclean spirits obey him. This type of demon possession can happen even to young children. Did you know that? I know there's a book out there written back in the, I think, the late 1800s, early 1900s. I didn't have time to research it and look it up again. But um, it's a story, a novel, of how two children begin to manifest the voices of certain immoral lovers and yet when someone comes on the scene they begin to giggle and laugh like little children. It's a secular book but the scripture confirms that even little children can be possessed by demons. Parents, protect your children and stay away from those evil things because you may be the stupid doorway that opens your children up to evil. Mark 7. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean 
spirit, heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord. Yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. I have another narrative indicating a young child in Mark excuse me, Matthew chapter 17. When they were come to the multitude, there came, uh, come down to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Now, you say, well, it might have been a you know, 17, 18, 19 year old child. No, Mark gives additional information about the age of the boy and the nature of the demon. Dealing with that same incident, Mark writes, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. So the first thing we learn about this demon is he had made the boy dumb, incapable of speaking. That's the first thing we learn. He answered him, O and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, wallowing and foaming. The demon is also capable of producing something similar to an epileptic fit. This demon has many talents, this particular one here in the passage. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, now here we learn how old the child was when he was demon-possessed. And he said, of a child. And the Greek word that is used there is paideion. That means a little child, an infant. That is the exact same word used by Herod when telling the wise men to search diligently for the child. It's used of Jesus when the wise man found him with Mary. It is used in Matthew 18, 2 and 4 of the little child that sat on Jesus' knee as an example of humility. It's a little child. In the case related to Herod, that's a child age two or younger. The father goes on, and oft times it, the demon, hath cast him, that's the little child, into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus saith unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child, and again we have Pideon, cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit. And the word foul there is akathartos, an unclean spirit. So this spirit, who's an unclean spirit, has the ability to cause a child to be dumb, that is, unable to speak, cause a child to have an epileptic, apparently, type of fit. Not all epilepsy is demon possession. And he is an unclean spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit. Ah, oh, we learned something else. He was able to make the child deaf. There's some dangerous things in the spirit world, folks. You'd better not mess with it. You have the warfare that goes on, and you're to be involved in it. God has given you the armor. He's given you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's always appropriate. But he has not given you apostolic authority. He's given you everything that is necessary for your spiritual warfare, but you are not an apostle. They had a different type of warfare because they were authenticating a new message from God 
and it was necessary for them to be able to counter in this dramatic way of casting out demons to counter the demonic opposition. But the scripture is complete now. The New Testament is closed. You take what God has given you, the word of God, and use it in your spiritual warfare. And believe me, there's plenty that you need to be involved in in relation to the word of God. Without running around like Simon, Simon Magus or the seven sons of Sceva, who wanted to make some money off of this little supernatural power business. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that many of the charismatic preachers are involved in demonism. That's a serious indictment, but what you look at here in the New Testament directs to that conclusion. We move on. The Spirit cried out and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead. These spirits can produce incredible physical trauma. Insomuch that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he was come into the house, now listen here carefully. See, the disciples had tried to cast him out. The disciples did have authority to cast out demons. But this one had given them trouble. Sometimes the big powerful demons are involved with little weak objects. You can't always tell just because this is a six foot eight inch tall tattooed motorcycle gang character with most of his teeth missing who carries knives and guns visibly and steals studs out of his jacket. You know, and he walks around in hobnail boots and beats people up. You know. Bad demons can be in little children. The disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? They were surprised. And he said unto them, this kind, because there are many different kinds, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Jesus had authority enough to say, get out, and he got out. But he said to the apostles who had the apostolic gifts, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. Now, folks, prayer and fasting is still available today. You have the right to pray and fast. In fact, you're encouraged to do so in Scripture. Jesus said the time's going to come when the bridegroom's not going to be here, and then shall they pray and fast. The bridegroom has gone back to heaven. Praying and fasting is certainly something still available for us today. Oh, it's not something to be done mechanically. It's not to be done with ulterior motives, such as I think I'm going to use this to lose weight and I'll get spiritual and physical at the same time. For the purpose of intense supplication before the throne of God's grace. Because there is something desperately that you want to see for his glory, not for your carnal indulgence, but for his glory to be done. There are many things that we can learn from just these passages about the nature and tactics of demonic forces, but for our purpose, it's here to point out that there will be demonic opposition to the work of God in revival, and there will also be attempts at counterfeiting the work of God, which is what we see here with the seven sons of Sceva, the, the priest. Now, I need to talk about, for just a moment, very briefly, things that are different. We've been talking about unclean demons, which is the kind of thing that we have involved going on in Acts chapter 19. But we need to make a contrast with the uncleanness in the Old Testament. Uncleanness in the Old Testament is broader and most frequently connected with specific Jewish prohibitions that no longer apply to the church. For example, number one, that which the body consumes, that is the dietary laws that no longer apply to the church. And we're specifically told that in the New Testament. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10 opened a whole new door in relation to food. And Paul confirms that in the passage I just quoted. Number two, that which comes out of the body is considered unclean. 
Three, the defilement by touching a dead body. And you remember that a, a person who touched a dead body had a certain period of uncleanness, and there were certain things a priest couldn't do if he touched a dead body. But that's not the focus of the New Testament. Number four, there were certain diseases like leprosy that were considered unclean. Number five, and that's the only one that com comes over to us in the New Testament, the Old Testament uncleanness also applied to what we have just seen, things related to sexual matters. Defilement coming from sexual discharge, defilement by all forms of immorality, it's listed all over the place in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the focus related exclusively to uncleanness from moral impurity. Everything from self-gratification to sodomy and worse, bestiality, necrophilia, and so on. The specific healings and the miracles that Philip did, back there in Acts chapter 8, are listed. But the specific miracles and healings that Paul does in Acts 19, they're just sort of clumped together, are not listed. The only thing that's listed is the, the napkins and the aprons. But all the other miracles that he was doing are not listed for us. We found out some key verses about counterfeits that help us understand the sons of Sceva in Acts 19 when we studied Acts 8 with Simon the sorcerer. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in that same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. In other words, counterfeits. Folks, don't be surprised by the counterfeits. There are people out there today who are, in fact, performing miracles. But they are counterfeits. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Sorcery and sorceries are mentioned twice in the virtues, verses and bewitched are mentioned twice here in these verses. The supernatural manifestations that Simon did drew attention to himself, not to God or to a message from God. Whenever that happens, that's the devil's counterfeit. Simon claimed that he was some great one. He claimed to be the personal manifestation of the power of God. Notice something else about that passage. The deception was long term. People were controlled for a very long time. They couldn't break the control regardless of their station in life. It says from the least to the greatest of them. Demonic activity is prevalent in the world today. We tend to think of witch doctors in Africa wearing the funny masks, you know, or the guys down in Haiti, you know, practicing their voodoo stuff and sticking pins into dolls. Folks, in primitive cultures, or we should say decadent cultures, there's nothing that's primitive. Uh, the primitive culture idea is an evolutionary concept. Think like a Christian. Those are decadent cultures, not primitive. Primitive implies they're on their way up. Decadent implies they're on their way down. The United States is moving to become a decadent culture. We think we're so advanced, we're on our way down. The way it manifests itself in a culture like this is far different than the way it manifests itself in those decadent cultures. Something else that's important to remember here this activity of Simon was going on in the same city, the very same city where Philip preached. God confronts the devil directly on what the devil thinks is his own territory. God attacks the devil's strongholds and God always wins. You know, never get despairing. I mean, it is something that despairs as you look around the culture that we have around us today. It's something that, humanly speaking, is enough to cause you to despair. But remember, you have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is a supernatural weapon that when you understand it and believe it, you've got to know it first. When you know it and you understand it and believe it, you can use it as the one weapon that advances the cause of Christ into Satan's territory. You don't have to run around performing miracles to do that. You have the finished, the complete, the final word of God. Are you using it? 
ours is a culture where spiritual warfare is going on and God has given you the one and only weapon that you need. You need the defensive armor, yes, when you go into battle. But you need the weapon that advances the cause of Christ, and that's the Word of God. Sorcery, magia, from which we get our word magic, the practice of the occult in all of its forms. We're not talking about parlor magic, sleight of hand, like pulling rabbits out of a hat. That is occult magic. The word bewitched here, ex istemi, that means to stand outside, the idiom to put someone out of their wits. He bewitched them, he put them out of their wits. He made them stand outside of themselves to, to be astounded, to be insane, to amaze, to astonish, to be beside oneself. We use that same type of terminology today. He's not the only sorcerer in the New Testament. We saw Elymas in Acts chapter 13, verses 6 or 8. We'll not read that. The purpose of the miracles there were to substantiate the doctrine of the Lord. It says so specifically in verse 8. He's called Bar-Jesus. That means son of Jesus. <laughs> Talk about a blasphemous claim. And then Philip faced a Samaritan sorcerer, but Paul faced a group of Jewish sorcerers, the seven Jewish sons of Sceva in the passage tonight. Just being a religious power broker, they were religious power brokers. Their father was the chief of the priests. They thought they had it made. Being a charismatic religious power broker doesn't mean that you are not playing with the devil. They were playing with the devil. Remember the outcome of this contest here in Acts 19. The three things that we saw tied to unclean spirits earlier. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord was magnified, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also that used curious arts broke their books together and burned them before all men and counted the price of them, 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The three things. We saw the purpose of God. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. It's the authentication of a message, what Paul is doing. Number two, notice the purpose of the demon. The demon wanted to make them naked. We saw that as one of the things that is characteristic of this type of demon all the way through scripture. Number three, notice the connection to money. That's something we covered just a few moments ago. Greed is tied to uncleanness because there is money in immorality. There's a lot more we could talk about. I'm just going to list these things for you briefly. The Bible has a lot to say on this subject. Sorcery and witchcraft were capital crimes in the Old Testament. God commanded those practicing witchcraft to be put to death. Exodus 22:18, Deuteronomy 18:10, 2 Chronicles 33:6. Witchcraft was practiced by Jezebel. And you see its connection to fornication in the New Testament, the book of Revelation where there's a woman who calls herself Jezebel, or she is called Jezebel, who's teaching God's servants to commit immoral deeds. But we see witchcraft practiced by Jezebel in 2 Kings 9. Sorcery and witchcraft are tied to the works of the flesh and idolatry. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Rebellion placed, is replaced in the same category as witchcraft, and it is connected to idolatry, immorality, and to stubbornness. Very important passage, and I've gone over it many times, so we'll not cover it again tonight. But 1 Samuel 15, verses 23 and 24. Witchcraft is connected to idolatry, immorality, and stubbornness. You know, Saul had failed to kill all of the people practicing witchcraft. God had told him to do it. His servants still knew where one was located. And because he had failed to obey God on that particular point, it ended up costing him his life and the life of his sons. What we do affects our children. That's in 1 Samuel 28, verses 3 through 25. In the scripture, God also deals with soothsayers, that's fortune tellers, astrologers. I suspect that at some time or other, some of you may have read an astrological horoscope in the newspaper and been curious about it. God deals with that. Astrologers, observers of times, diviners, prognosticators, those who foretell the future, incantation, augury, that's like the Romans, they would cut open a chicken and look at its guts to see what the future portended. Bizarre. And the Chaldeans. One of the key words for the, in the Old Testament for this is nahash. 
It's the word that means to hiss. That's like the hissing of a serpent. It tells you something about the source of the information. We find that in Joshua 13.22, Ezekiel 13.28, Daniel 2.27, 4.7.5.7, Isaiah 2.6, Isaiah 57.3, Micah chapter 5, verse 12. There were diviners in divination. We find this coming over in the New Testament, actually. In Acts chapter 16, verse 16, there was a girl who was possessed, it says, with a spirit of python. Now, in the King James, it's translated the spirit of divination, but that Greek word is python. Python is a massive, giant snake that crushes and swallows its prey. And why was she doing it? For money. It says, when, when her owners saw that she no longer had that demon in her, they got mad because that was one of their sources of money. Money and demonism. Divination related to the claim that the diviner was getting new special revelation, which flattered the sucker who believed him. Very clearly stated in Ezekiel 12, 24 and Ezekiel 13, 7. And just to tie it back in to remind you that on Thursday a week, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, I'll be talking about Mormonism. That claim for new special revelation is key to Mormonism. It's also key to many of the current charismatic cults. Sorcery also used drug-induced demon possession. We find that in Revelation 9.21 and 18.23, the word pharmakeia is found there. Pharmakeus from pharmacon and pharmakos. Now, <laughs> the practice of pharmacy is okay because that's not the point, point of pharmacies today, but that's where that word comes from. It was used historically of those who were poisoners. It was used for those who gave spell-giving potions. It was used for magicians and sorcerers. Nahum 3.4, because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. It covers hallucinogenic drugs, psychotropic drugs, that's mind-altering drugs, and hypnotism. Pain medication is involved in a lot of this today. But you know what we're learning here in the book of Acts? Very clear here in Acts chapter 19. God can break the hold of any kind of control that Satan has over you. You know, I know there are a lot of Christians who are drug addicts. Oh, they wouldn't call themselves drug addicts. They simply say, well, you know, I, I do have to take this pain medication and I have to take some pretty big doses of it and I have to take it, you know, morning, noon and night and sometimes in the middle of the night because I feel some pain, I get up and take another shot of it. Are you a drug addict? Remember, it opens the door for demonic type of activity. Drugs that control your mind, control your body's pain medication, anxiety medication, and so on. It's dangerous. Now back to our text, verse 12. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Paul had a 100% success rate, not only using the aprons and handkerchiefs, but also in casting out demons from a distance. See, not all those people showed up to Paul. That's the purpose of the aprons and the handkerchiefs. Now, there are faith healers today who will tell you in their television broadcasts and in their radio broadcasts and in their published literature that if you will just, they send you these envelopes. I've gotten some of them in the mail. And they have this little teeny square of cloth in the envelope. How many of you have ever received one of these? <laughs> At least one person. You get this envelope and in it there's this little square of cloth. And the letter that's attached to that says, I'm so-and-so, and, you know, uh, God has given me this special gift of being able to heal people. And whatever your particular physical problem is, you know, you write it here on this slip. And then, to show your faith, enclose a gift of, and they'll have little boxes there. One's marked 25, 50, 75, 100, 
other, and they put it at the bottom, not at the top, so that you give $1 up here, but down here they're expecting something more than 100C. That's why that other box always shows up at the bottom. And so how great is your faith? How much do you really, really want to be healed? Send this cloth back to me. You pray over this cloth. You touch this cloth. And I will pray over this cloth, and then I will heal you from a distance. The cloths were going a different direction here. The cloths were taken from Paul and brought to the sick person. <laughs> there they want you to send it back so they can bless it and heal you, but you send it back with a gift. Folks, that's charlatanism at its very, very least. And it's demonism at its worst. Never be taken in by that kind of a thing, no matter how bad you think your sickness is, no matter how terrible your body feels, no matter how discouraged and oppressed you feel, don't get involved in that kind of stuff. We live and die by the word of God. We live and die by the will of God. We can pray for one another and for healing. The Bible tells us that. James chapter 5. We can ask if our sickness is related to sin, and it must be as a result of sin. That's the point of James 5. For the elders of the church to come and pray over us. But don't get involved in the kind of stuff that the seven sons of Sceva were trying to do. Or that Elymas the sorcerer wanted to do. Or the kind of stuff that Simon Magus wanted to do, Simon the sorcerer, in Acts chapter 8. No, we're not involved in casting out demons. We're involved in the proclamation of the word of God, and this is enough and Jesus proved it in Matthew chapter 4. This is enough to turn even the devil himself on the run. At every temptation of the three temptations that the devil gave to Christ, he quoted scripture and said, It is written. It is written. Anything Jesus would have said would have been scripture. Jesus had authority, as we've seen in these illustrations given tonight, he had the authority to personally, directly speak scripture. He's God. But so that you and I would understand that we don't have that authority, what he did was quoted the Old Testament on all three of those different occasions where Satan tempted him. You have that same authority there. You can quote the scripture. Even Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil over the body of Moses, durst not rebuke him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. You are not as powerful as Michael the archangel. Stick with the one weapon that God has given you, which is always more powerful than Satan or any of his demonic hosts. Stick with the word of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the scripture and for its power. We thank you for the protective armor that you have given to us. The shield of faith, which quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth. Feet shot of the preparation of the gospel of peace. But you've also given us the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God. Help us to be faithful in studying it, learning it, memorizing it, meditating upon it, applying it and using it every day. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 